there! I'm Clemma with another Plus Review! This time for Zoda's Revenge Star Tropics 2. Why the sequel instead of the original Star Tropics? Well, this was the only one I could find. Therefore, it is the one I own. Since it is a direct sequel to the original, I'm going to assume that if you're looking at a review of the direct sequel, then you have played the original. Nevertheless, in the spirit of being thorough, especially since I had to look into it due to jumping straight into the sequel myself, here is a very quick summary of the original Star Tropics via Wikipedia. Mike Jones goes to visit his uncle, Dr. Stephen Jones, on Sea Island. However, when he arrives, he finds his uncle has gone missing. Mike finds finds a message from Dr. Jones saying that he had been abducted by aliens. Mike eventually meets his uncle's assistant, who confirms that Dr. Jones was abducted. The assistant also gives Mike a device to find his uncle. When Mike finds his uncle, he learns that there are three magic cubes, which are in the hands of the evil alien leader, Zoda. Mike eventually defeats Zoda and retrieves the magic cubes. He also becomes friends with one of the aliens named Micah. Micah and the other survivors of her alien race are invited to stay on Earth on Sea Island. Alright, with that out of the way, let's move on to the review. First off, a little history. Now, like I said, Zoda's Revenge Star Tropics 2 is a sequel to the original Star Tropics. Both those games were developed by the Nintendo R&D 3. Zoda's Revenge was originally released in North America on the NES on March 15, 1994, and would be the final game exclusive to the NES developed by Nintendo. However, it would later be re-released on the Wii Virtual Console and Wii U Virtual Console. Now, as this game was released in 1994, long before development history would be readily available, I am unfortunately able to add much more to this development story. So instead, let us shift gears to the story in the game, which is much bigger than I thought it'd be going into this game. However, if you don't want any spoilers, then you can skip to this time on screen. Now, some time has passed since the events on Sea Island. One day, Mike is contacted by Micah telepathically and told that her father had a strange dream and told her, was it a cat I saw? Was it a rat I saw? Mike takes the message to his uncle and Dr. Jones concludes that it is a cipher of some kind. Once Dr. Jones solves it, Mike reads it out loud with a book called The Oxford Wonderworld. He is then sucked into the past, awakening in the Stone Age. Walking around, Mike meets with the cave artist Picasso. Picasso's son Shorty was taken away by a monster known as Yum Yum. Mike goes to save Shorty and the other children who are taken away. After Mike slays the beast and lets the children free, he finds a strange block that was left by the monster. He is then contacted by Micah telepathically again. She explains to him that he's been flung into the past and he needs to find the magic blocks. Mike reads the chant out loud again and is now sent to ancient Egypt. He learns that Cleopatra knows where the block is and will give it to Mike in exchange for a pizza. How Cleopatra knows what a pizza is is beyond me, but anyhow, Mike leaves to get her a pizza. After getting through a dungeon and beating a very giant and very annoying scorpion, Mike takes a camel and meets with the pizza delivery guy. After retrieving the pizza, Mike returns to deliver it to Cleopatra. The Egyptian queen eats the entire pizza by herself and then brings Mike to the pyramid where the block is. However, there is a force field in the pyramid blocking Mike's way. Speaking with some locals, Mike learns that there is a master in the northern desert who would be able to teach him how to get past the barrier. Mike goes north and chases this monkey through a maze. After catching the monkey, Mike learns that it is the master. The monkey teaches Mike how to use psychic powers. And with those new powers, Mike is able to destroy the barrier inside the pyramid. Mike traverses the difficult pyramid, fighting the undead and solving puzzles. There were a lot of puzzles in this dungeon. And finally, meets with the boss, an undead pharaoh. After defeating the boss, Mike finds the block in the back of the dungeon. Now that he has the block, Mike reads the chant out loud again to go to his next location. This time being 221B Baker Street. After taking a look around, Mike meets THE Sherlock Holmes. Holmes tells Mike that he has been tipped off to a robbery that will take place at the museum and urges Mike to investigate with him. At the museum, Mike and Holmes sees what looks like to be Zoda. However, the individual introduces himself as Zoda X. Nevertheless, Zoda X steals the artifact from the museum, which turns out to be a magic block. Mike and Holmes give chase. While Holmes looks to cut Zoda X off, Mike chases the alien through the sewers. 
At one point, while traversing the sewers, Zoda X has a brain-like creature attack Mike, though Mike is easily able to fend it off. After getting through the second sewer dungeon, Mike catches up with Zoda X. After a tough battle, Mike is able to destroy Zoda X and retrieve the block. Upon returning to the surface, Mike explains the situation to Holmes. The detective decides to let Mike keep the block. He also deduces that if this was Zoda X, then there is also likely a Zoda Y and Zoda Z as well, which means they're probably after the blocks too. Just as a quick side note, I do wish that the Victorian era chapter would have done more with Sherlock Holmes. There wasn't really a mystery to solve with the great detective, though both sewer dungeons were rather fun to get through and I liked how Holmes was characterized, being brave and confident enough to take on an evil alien if need be. Anyhow, Mike takes out the Oxford Wonderworld again to travel to the next time period slash location. This time, Mike finds himself in the Wild West. Just before we get into the Wild West, I just have to express my disappointment that unlike Egypt that had a historical rep or Victorian England that had a fictional character, there is no unique rep in the Wild West, a missed opportunity to have someone like Jesse James or Annie Oakley as the person Mike meets here. But no, there isn't even an original character like Picasso. Anyhow, when Mike arrives in the Wild West, he finds himself by a small town around the time of the Gold Rush. In this town, there is a shop run by the only named character, Bob, as well as a saloon where Mike can meet a pianist who will give him some directions. Someone will also give Mike, an underage teenager, some alcohol. But hey, it's the 1800s! So I suppose underage drinking makes sense for the time period. Anyways, a random civilian informs Mike that he's seen one of the blocks in the caves where one can find gold. Mike then buys dynamite so that he can find the magic block. Mike makes his way through a small dungeon and faces the difficult rock cyclops at the end of it. After making it through the dungeon, Mike meets with a horse who powers up Mike's psychic abilities. The horse encourages Mike in his quest to find the blocks, and the young team moves on to the next dungeon. While the second dungeon is rather large, with a minecart riding skeleton and giant skeleton miner, Mike is able to make his way through it and retrieve the next block. Without much trouble, Mike reads aloud the chant once more and moves on to the next time period. This time, Mike ends up in the Italian Renaissance. Exploring around, Mike learns that there is an inventor who might know something about the magic blocks. When Mike goes to the inventor's house, there is no one there, but there does appear to be someone trapped in a statue. Mike traverses through the inventor's basement, making it past the man's machines and traps to eventually find a chisel and hammer. When Mike returns, he uses these tools to break the inventor out of the statue, and he turns out to be Leonardo da Vinci! Leonardo informs Mike that he was attacked by Zoda Y. Leonardo tells Mike that he saw the block in a castle quite far from here. As thanks, Leonardo gives Mike a katana, as well as lets him borrow his flying machine to get to the castle. Before leaving, Mike critiques Leonardo Mona Lisa, prompting Leonardo to change the famous painting, giving her some radical hair, as Mike puts it. During his air travel, Mike is contacted by Micah telepathically. Apparently, aliens had arrived on Sea Island, and they not only hypnotized Mike's uncle, but also learned how to travel through time. Although, at this point in the story, Mike shouldn't be surprised since he's already run into and defeated Zoda X, not to mention the aliens he sometimes finds in the dungeons he treks through. Never Nevertheless, Micah tries to warn Mike that the aliens may be plotting a trap, but she gets disconnected. Once Mike arrives at the castle, he has to traverse through this maze of a building and make his way through some mini dungeon rooms. Without a traditional long dungeon or a boss to block his way, Mike is able to make his way through the castle quite easily and collect the next block. However, just as Micah warned, when Mike takes the block, Zoda Y appears. Mike is able to hang on to all of his blocks, but Zoda Y forcibly sends Mike to a new time period. Turns out, Zoda Y sent Mike to Transylvania during the Age of Vampires. And despite how Zoda Y taunted Mike before sending him here, Mike does not encounter a single vampire, though there are a lot of bats. Nevertheless, after making it through a very difficult dungeon, Mike confronts Zoda Y in a very difficult battle where Zoda Y summons bats and transforms into some sort of owl creature, Mike is able to eliminate Zoda Y. Our hero then collects another block. 
With only one more block to find and one more version of Zoda to face, Mike heads to the next time period. Mike finds himself in the medieval times. As he travels, he learns that there is some sort of dragon plaguing the land. Upon meeting King Arthur, Mike is not only knighted, but also becomes one of the knights of the round table. So he is tasked to take out the dragon. Thus, Mike makes it through the dragon's lair. The first half of it is actually a rather easy jaunt, and at this point, Mike simply takes out a rogue knight. Mike then meets Merlin, who reveals that he was the monkey and the horse that taught Mike how to use psychic powers. Merlin powers up Mike one last time and tells the hero that the final block is in the hands of the dragon. With that, Mike makes his way through the rest of the lair. After a difficult dungeon and an even more difficult boss fight against the dragon, Mike is able to defeat the dragon and claim the final block. Mike tries putting all the blocks together, but nothing happens. Confused, Mike leaves the dragon's lair. Outside, he gets a call from Micah, urging him to come home to Sea Island, but the call gets disconnected again. Regardless, Mike takes out the Oxford Wonderworld to travel back to the present. When Mike arrives on Sea Island, he goes to the village of Coral Cola to find that everyone has been turned into wild boars. A random fisherman who was just as confused as Mike tells the team that he heard strange noises from this tunnel, so Mike goes to investigate. Mike easily makes it through the first bit of the tunnel, quickly meeting face to face with this skeleton snake and just easily taking it out. However, after falling down a hole into a great dungeon, Mike hears a sinister laugh. Once the path opens up to him again, Mike finds that the bosses he previously defeated have all returned. After a long, difficult gauntlet of seven bosses in a row, Mike reaches the end of the dungeon. Here, he comes face to face with Zoda Zed. However, when Mike first sees Zoda Zed, he's a bunch of... Uh, whatever these things are. But eventually, Zoda Zed reveals his true form. Mike has a long, tough battle with Zoda Zed in both his base form and his powered up form. But nevertheless, he successfully defeats the final Zoda, returning everyone back to normal. With the final threat gone for good, Mike returns to the village. He meets with Micah and the chief, the latter of whom is able to solve the puzzle of the blocks. Once the puzzle is solved, the blocks take on the form of Micah's father, Hirokan. Hirokan explains that he had sealed himself in the seven blocks and scattered them across time to protect himself from Zoda's attack. Now that Zoda is gone for good, the Argonians are safe to return to their home planet. Mike runs after them, all while thinking about the crazy adventure he had gone through. This game is the hardest game I have ever played. Even Earthbound Beginnings and Stinkman 20 XD 6 were easier. However, I do not believe that is the game's fault, because I did not come across any bugs or jank during my long playthrough of this game. It was entirely my lack of skill, as it took me over 21 hours to beat the game, but according to to how long to beat, the average playtime is 6 hours. Therefore, I do not want to hold the difficulty against the game. Anyhow, the bulk of the actual gameplay comes from the dungeons where Mike will actually encounter the enemies, as the overworld is really just for story and exploration. In the dungeons, Mike can jump around and shoot or throw items at enemies. It is a little clunky to switch between items though, since you have to do so on the pause screen. This isn't only for attacking items, but support items as well. However, one of Mike's most powerful weapons is actually being able to shoot on a diagonal. With the power of shooting on a diagonal, Mike can easily evade enemy attacks while doing damage himself. His other powerful weapons are the three-way shot, the katana, and the ultra psychic shockwave. As implied in the story section, both the katana and the ultra psychic shockwave are the powered up versions of the axe and regular psychic shockwave. The three-way shot, meanwhile, is a temporary throwing weapon that shoots out in three directions and does considerable damage. The katana line of weapons are generally short range, though that does make sense because even though the animation indicates Mike is throwing an infinite number of these weapons, it is more likely that developers imagined Mike was swinging the weapons around as a normal person would. Regardless, these weapons do a consistent amount of damage. The Psychic Shockwave line, on the other hand, has damage that is directly linked to Mike's health. The less health Mike has, the less damage the Psychic Shockwave will deal. However, despite this drawback, I personally prefer using the Psychic Shockwave due to its long range. Therefore, making it good for defensive play. When fully powered, the Ultra Psychic Shockwave can even clear an entire room. There are also platforming sections and puzzle sections in the dungeons. 
The puzzles, though, do not have a different form of gameplay, but rather make you think about the shooting mechanic in different ways. The platforming sections are not so bad, especially if you're actually good at platforming games, unlike me. There are also some segments where you can bypass entire areas by doing a difficult platforming section instead. Just be careful, because like other traditional platformers, there are platforms that move and some that disappear after a short while. When walking on the ground, Mike cannot fall into the abyss. However, there are some platforms that do allow Mike to just walk off. I found that normally, these are the ones that are moving. Of course, like other adventure games, there are healing items for Mike to find, and like platformers, there are also checkpoints that Mike can respawn at. Unfortunately though, whenever Mike respawns, he does so with only 5 hearts and none of his temporary items, weapons and potions alike. The same is true when you get a game over, as Mike only has 3 lives. Though you can find try your luck signs which will grant 1 or 2 extra lives. For a couple of dungeons, there are even places shortly before the boss where you can farm for lives so you don't lose your progress. However, that is not the case for every dungeon. I found that there are usually two checkpoints per dungeon, though how far they are from the boss or even the mid-boss varies. What's more is that once you beat a dungeon, whether it's the end of a story chapter or not, all your lives are reset. So even if you beat the boss with 6 lives or something like that, once you're out of the dungeon, you're back down to 3. Furthermore, you can only save between dungeons and story chapters. Since I was playing on a Wii, I did not have access to save states either, making the game just that much harder. And because it was that much harder, thereby making me play that much longer, I got to listen to the audio presentation quite a lot. And I am not a fan of it. Despite playing for over 21 hours, dying constantly, thus meaning I'd have to listen to the same song on repeat, I cannot remember a single song from this OST. I had to actually pull up this game's OST for this review since I cannot remember any of the songs, and even then, I felt like I had never heard any of these songs, period, despite having the recorded evidence that I did. The sound effects for the most part were fine. The only thing that bothered me was the sound that was made when attacking at critical health. What? I feel that is mostly my fault for being in that position so many times. The visual presentation on the other hand was great. Despite being from the NES era, the graphics are pretty gorgeous for its time, which does make sense considering it was the last NES exclusive first party game, therefore the developers could take full advantage of the console's limitations. I also like the art direction for both the overworld and dungeons for different reasons. The overworld art direction made me feel like I was having an RPG adventure, having a more cute and nostalgic art style, whereas the dungeon's art direction felt more realistic in comparison, giving the feel of a serious bout. Both art styles really complement the game's story direction. Similarly, to my great surprise, there are full-on cutscenes in this game. Going in, I thought there'd just be flavor text that lead you in the right direction, so full-on cutscenes in an NES game were amazing! When I told family that there were actual cutscenes in this game, they were shocked that it was even possible. So that's a huge feat in this game's favor. And while the cutscenes weren't long, they served their purpose well, and I thought they were well animated for the time. And that does sum up my overall thoughts. Zoda's Revenge Star Tropics 2 shocked me at how good it is. Don't get me wrong, for a player like me, it was Nintendo hard, but I still really enjoyed it. The story was very fun and wacky, and I really liked how it was presented. I do feel like they could have pushed the premise of the story even more, but I enjoyed what was there, and I am also being more forgiving due to how the game was released in the early 1990s. Also when considering the time period, some of the things this game managed to do visually was mind-blowing. I just wish I could remember a single song from the game. The gameplay itself was satisfying. It felt good to take out monsters. Despite how difficult it was, it still felt fair and I was always ecstatic when I finally defeated a really hard boss after hours of play. Admittedly, I'm still impressed with myself for being able to beat it, despite how others may find the game far easier than me. I liked Zoda's Revenge Star Tropics 2. I know it is hard, and because of that it might not be for everyone, but I'd still really recommend it for fans of the genre, and the patience or will to play games that are on the more difficult side of things. Even though I know it won't happen, I am now happy to wait for a Star Tropics 3 due to how much I liked Star Tropics 2.